defense of battered women. Suo? Hey, thanks so much, Carrie. Uh, like Carrie, I want to welcome all of you to this webinar today. I'm very excited about it. As Carrie said, I'm Sue Ostoff, and I'm with the National Clearing House for the Defense of Battered Women, and we're located in Philadelphia. And today, this webinar is actually the sixth in our series of webinars from our project on ending mass incarceration, centralizing racial justice, and developing alternatives, the role of the anti-domestic violence and sexual assault programs. Um, so before I go any further, I really want to thank the Office on Violence Against Women for their support of this webinar and for their support of this very important project. So as you're probably aware, today's webinar is titled Exploring Restorative Justice to Address Sexual and Intimate Partner Violence, Centering the Wisdom, Needs, and Safety of Survivors. And I think this is the first time um, we've done a webinar where we had someone from Ireland, so I think that shows <laughs> the breadth of the uh, uh, interest in this. Um, and let's see if we can go to the next slide here. I know that's really small type, and I apologize for that. But in an effort to save time, I want to do a very brief introduction of our really amazing speaker, Sujatha Baldiga. As you can see, or hopefully you can see from the slide, um, Sujatha is currently the director of the Restorative Justice Project at Impact Justice, which is in Oakland, and she's also the vice president there. You can also see from the bio that she was a victim advocate, a public defender, and a Soros Justice Fellow, among other things. But what the slide doesn't say is that Sujatha is an internationally known thought leader. And she has really been instrumental in helping people around the world to think differently and more creatively about what justice might look like. She is super smart. She's passionate. She's willing to put herself out there in unbelievably courageous ways. And she does this work with her head, her heart, and her soul. I've been lucky enough to know her since she was a law intern at the National Clearing House way back in 1999. And my love and respect for her grows every time I get to connect with her. So this is a real pleasure. So thank you, Sujatva. There's so much more I could say about her and her groundbreaking and really incredibly brave work. But I really want to turn this over to her so she can as, uh, have as much time as possible. As Carrie mentioned, I'll be collecting questions for Sujatha during the presentation. We plan to leave about 15 minutes at the end for questions. So if you have questions, please put them in the chat box. And we'll be monitoring those. And I will do my very best to get to as many as I can. Uh, as you can see, this webinar is both closed captioned and a, we have an ASL interpreter today. So thank you, Angie, who's doing the captioning, and Ben, who is doing the ASL interpretation. Um, and we're going to encourage Sujata to speak slowly so our interpreters can get everything down. <laughs> <laughs> she really is one of the fastest speaking people I know. So we're going to be very careful about this. And Ben is going to help us and help her by telling her to slow down, OK, <laughs> if they need it, if he needs it. <laughs> just, just another reminder, dear. So thank you so much, Sandra, you. for your really important work. And thank you for your willingness to share it with us today. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Suo. And it really is just a joy as I've seen the names uh, pouring in to the chat box. Uh, so many familiar names. And, uh, and, and for the names that are not familiar, just feeling a deep sense of gratitude and joy uh, that um, people are interested in this. Um, and so, uh, so Suo mentioned, you know, my first job out of law school was with the National Clearing House for the Defense of Battered Women, who's been a mentor to me um, and just uh, a wonderful um, partner in thinking for decades now. And, um, so it really is wonderful to be invited back into this space uh, and into this community uh, to bring the things that I've been thinking about somewhat in relationship uh, to the movements to end domestic and sexual violence and, and somewhat outside uh, of those communities. Um, and uh, I'll be sharing a little bit about that today. Uh, but I also want to start with thanking Better Women's Justice Project, uh, thanking uh, OVW, um, and just you know everyone for coming with an open mind and an open heart. 
uh, about uh, how we can be better meeting the needs of survivors and families and communities uh, struggling with intimate partner violence and uh, sexual harm. So um, a little bit about how it is that I came to this work. Uh, I am a survivor of child sexual abuse, of um, sexual assault, and of rape. And I grew up in a home uh, where I think my mother recently beautifully described it as just um, living with a constant state of sort of anxiety about uh, whether something she was going to do was going to make my father angry. Um, and then she paused, you know, she's really thoughtful, and she said, it's really complicated, isn't it, because there are also really wonderful things about him. Um, and I, I just really um, honored her being able to hold those two truths. Uh, and so, um, and, and I think that, you know, those two truths really are at the base of why it is that um, – uh, many people don't leave uh, situations that are abusive, um, that many people uh, want to find ways to help relationships uh, that are going to remain in some form or fashion be uh, more violence-free. Um, and so um, that's sort of my personal um, approach to my personal reasons for coming to the work. Um, and then also my reasons, uh, sort of my professional reasons for coming to the work is that after years of being a um, victim advocate, you know, I went to law school, to uh, uh, be um, to, to become a prosecutor, actually, um, and I, I really wanted to focus on um, uh, domestic violence, sexual harm. That was sort of my career my career plan, uh, and instead, I ended up becoming a defense attorney after um, you know uh, David Rodofsky, who was my law professor, uh, told me about Sue Ostoff and her work, and, and he said, I think you know I, I was questioning. Uh, whether criminalization was the right approach uh, to addressing intimate partner violence and sexual harm. Um, I'd had a personal change of heart myself about my feelings about my uh, father who had passed away. Um, and, and so, um, I, you know, I sort of got my in the defense community there and where I stayed for the next 10 or so years. Uh, and uh, what I learned really was that of all the folks that I represented, whether or not it was explicitly a case in which a survivor uh, was, um, you know, who I was defending, that it was, it was someone who initially came onto my desk as someone who was known to be a survivor um, or not. Eventually what I learned was that everyone I represented, uh, regardless of what they had done, had a childhood that was uh, horrific. And, um, uh, and I often identified with people as survivors, even if that's not how their case was first presented to me. Uh, I don't say this as a, um, an excuse for anything uh, that folks have done, but rather as a context that we need in order to understand how to end the harms that uh, our communities and our families um, suffer with and from. So uh, that's just a little bit um, of background before I launch into, um, oops, hang on, having a little trouble with um, my advanced slide here, but oh, there we go. Uh, to what what is restorative justice? I think is sort of a good place to start. And uh, I apologize to folks who are well versed in the theory and practice of restorative justice. I am going to um, do a little bit of background information for people who are new to the subject. And uh, so I have several mentors in this work. Uh, Kay Pranis, uh, is the person who first taught me circles. She learned from the indigenous people of several different indigenous communities in Canada. Uh, Howard Zare is one of my mentors and sort of father figure to me. Uh, he's with Eastern Mennonite University um, and, uh, and sort of is known as the grandfather of restorative justice. And another really deep heart mentor of mine is uh, the Honorable Robert Yazzie, who was a former Chief Justice of the Navajo Nation. And all three of these people have really different uh, definitions of restorative justice. And Justice Yazzie, in particular, says there is no way to define it <laughs> and that it is hubris to try. Um, and so I want to start with um, acknowledging that there are many uh, people who think that it is a way of life um, and that it is beyond definition. And that doesn't really work for a webinar, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about definitions that uh, do exist that might help us uh, get our brains around it. Um, but um, in short, um, when we think about wrongdoing today, right, and when I train, let's say, prosecutors' offices and I ask them, 
Uh, so when you get a file on your desk, or what are some of the questions that come to mind? And uh, folks pretty quickly uh, can rattle off some of these questions, right? What, what law was broken? Who broke it? Um, what are things I need to know about that person? And, and what should be the appropriate punishment uh, based on the harm that's been done? Um, and so Howard Zare discusses restorative justice as a paradigm shift in the way in which we think about wrongdoing and harm. Restorative justice asks a very different set of questions. It asks who's been harmed and what are their needs and whose obligation is it uh, to meet those needs. And so when we think about uh, these questions sort of side by side, um, it really is uh, a very different set of questions, right? Um, and I think it brings to mind sort of who and what do we attend to. Uh, in the first set of questions, you can see really we centralize those who have harmed. Um, and in the second set of questions, we really centralize those who've been harmed. And I think what's really important in looking at the restorative justice questions, people often say they want to call it victim-centered. Um, and, I, and I do think that there's an orientation in a way around victim's needs uh, when we frame the questions this way. Um, but it also leaves the possibility that there might be multiple people who were harmed, uh, even people who do harm. Uh, can also experience harm. And so uh, if we are going to be truly expansive uh, in our thinking around uh, how effective restorative justice can be at getting at uh, what my dear friend and colleague in the work, Sonia Shaw, calls the cause of the cause of the cause of the cause, <laughs> then I think a more broad and expansive notion of how we look at these three questions, who was harmed, what do they need, and whose obliga obligation is it to meet those needs, um, is, it, you know, it's a, it's a better way to think more expansively. Um, so the big picture, really, is that uh, crime is a violation of people and interpersonal relationships. Interestingly, not the state. Uh, it doesn't mean that the state doesn't have some role. Um, but rather that that's not the primary violation, right? Um, and that those violations create obligations, and that the central obligation is to, uh, to the degree that it's possible, uh, to do right by the folks that you've harmed, right? And that this is this is the orientation uh, around uh, restorative justice um, in, in terms of yeah, this is the big picture. So, uh, who are restorative justice facilitators? Really, who can hold these spaces? Uh, and, you know, people often ask me, do you have to be a lawyer? And I, I often say it's best if you're not. Um, lawyers really get trained to, to pick a side and, and to win. Um, and that's what, there's a noble thing in that. Um, but when I think about sort of my own family and I think about uh, the shape of a circle uh, versus a courtroom, I really think there are no sides, right, um, that I would have been happier to have seen uh, the improvement in the life uh, of everyone in my family, including my father, um, and that I would want to see all of us uh, move forward in a good way, as Justice Yazi says. So, uh, so ideally, restorative justice facilitators and, and those holding space in the circle really come with the notion not of like a mediator's neutrality, where you're driving two people to the center, but rather with a notion of equal partiality, a desire that people who've been harmed and people who are responsible for that harm, as well as the community, can all walk away from a restorative justice experience um, moving forward in a good way, um, having some improvement in their lives, having more of a sense of uh, justice and repair and safety, um, and whatever uh, the needs are that arose through the restorative justice process uh, getting met. So um, at the Restorative Justice Project at Impact Justice, we primarily work uh, in two models or uh, approaches, uh, and those are CIRCLE and Restorative Community Conferencing. And CIRCLE is called many things all over the world. It is done in many different ways uh, all over the world. Uh, some people call them peacemaking circles. Some people call it circle process. Um, uh, Jerry Theo is an amazing um, you know, trainer that works primarily in the Latino community, but more broadly, um, and you know, he calls it Socolos de Paz. Like, there's 
just so many different approaches to circle and things that are similar to circle um, that also may serve some of the purposes of circle. And the other model uh, that we work in, so before I move forward, uh, circle uh, is something that if we look far enough back in all of our cultures, we will see that, that there were times and places uh, where our people, no matter where we come from in the world, knew how to be in a circle and to, to celebrate, to mourn, to solve problems, uh, to heal, to strategize. Uh, in, in, in a way in which everyone was looking at one another. Uh, maybe there was a fire in the middle. Maybe it was in a sweat lodge. Uh, maybe it was um, at Stonehenge. Uh, but it, was, uh, it is something that if we look far enough back in all of our cultures, it is, it is there. Um, and so restorative community conferencing is the other um, model that we work in. Oh, I'm so sorry. One other thing about CIRCLE. So some of the similarities that exist in circle processes is often that there's some way of regulating that the dialogue operates where um, either through a talking piece or, or some other object that uh, an object is representing who is speaking next. And in most uh, circumstances, that object is passed in a singular direction uh, where each person gets to share deeply and from the heart about the topic at hand. Um, and um, and the talking piece can go around and around and around on a singular question uh, until there's some sense of resolution, until the person keeping the circle uh, feels that it's time to ask the next question, or, or that a new question arises naturally from the group. Um, restorative community conferencing is slightly different in that, that there's more of an order of speaking. This is a model that uh, we learned and have adapted from uh, Maori folks in New Zealand, uh, family group conferencing um, is something that has been uh, adapted and changed uh, starting in the late 1980s in New Zealand uh, in a way that um, they, they replaced basically youth criminalization through uh, family group conferencing and restorative justice processes of this nature, um, where today there's less than 100 people uh, locked up in New Zealand. Um, and uh, the default is for crimes to be sent to family group conferencing, including uh, crimes like uh, teen dating violence and sexual assault, and, um, that, that these are the crimes that actually the prosecutors have to file something to take the case out of restorative justice uh, for the cases that they feel are inappropriate for restorative justice for, for family group conferencing. Um, and, and again, the order of speaking is there in that it's usually that the, the person who's done harm speaks first and makes some sort of um, an offering, a prayer, something, a poem, um, but that then it turns really to the person who's, who's been harmed to describe at length uh, what it is that they experience, how do they define the harm. Um, and then the young person has an opportunity to answer to that, and the victim asks questions of, of the young person who's done harm, uh, and then everyone gets to weigh in on how they were impacted by it, and then they move into a, um, a a process of making a plan to repair the harm that's often done just with the young person and their family, uh, the person who's, who's done the harm, um, working with their family to create a draft of that plan, coming back into the group, um, and then sort of tweaking that plan collectively until, by consensus, it meets everyone's needs. Uh, circle process can also produce a plan, um, and uh, circle process can also be sort of tailored in a way that the person who's been harmed gets to decide who speaks first. Uh, maybe they want to go first. Maybe they don't want to go first. Um, but all of this can be can be sort of planned in advance of the actual uh, meeting, whether it's through circle or restored community conferencing. Um, so a couple stories, just very briefly, I want to talk about. Uh, I've had the honor of facilitating uh, a couple cases uh, in teen dating violence and in sexual harm. Uh, Nuri Nusrat, who is a coworker of mine, has done more work in sexual harm now, uh, primarily with teenagers um, at, at uh, uh, different high schools in the area. Um, and um, in terms of facilitating face-to-face -face dialogue, what I can say, particularly with the young people I've been working with, uh, is that there's a certain point at which, whether it is in prep, preparation for the circle or the family group conference, or in the circle itself, that 
the people who have done the harm, right, particularly young men, will say something to the effect of, I need help. Uh, help me not be like my dad. Um, and, and really, these are uh, breakthrough moments where we can really understand uh, where it is that, you know, um, transgenerational trauma is playing itself out in uh, interpersonal violence and, and sexual violence. And also, um, where there's sort of an opening, uh, a genuine sort of softening and a request for assistance in, in turning one's life around. Um, what I also see that is, I think, as a survivor, incredibly empowering for me is when um, a, young, a young person or whoever it is who has experienced sexual harm uh, really breaks down what went wrong in uh, when the sexual assault occurred uh, really, like one young woman really schooling uh, the person who assaulted her about what no means no means, um, and really just, uh, it's a moment that will stay with me forever, where this young woman who had decided that in the circle she was going to have her uh, mother speak instead of her, she said, I'm not going to say anything, I just want to sit there and listen, my mother knows what I want him to know, and the minute she saw him, uh, instead she just started talking. And, um, you know, at one point she was saying, you know, uh, I know you know what no means no means because we learned it in school together, right, in health class or something, right, she's saying. But when I was pushing your hands away, that was no. And when I was crying, that was no. And when I was saying I'm not that kind of girl, that was no. And she was, you know, her voice was raised. She, like, her mother says after the conference, right, that she saw that as a moment in which her daughter genuinely uh, – embraced her power, really uh, understood her own sexuality, understood her own, um, uh, her own right to her sexuality and herself and her body. And, um, you know, and it was really interesting in that dialogue, too, was that she admitted that she had had a crush on this boy, uh, but that didn't mean that he got to do these things to her without her consent. And uh, so these kinds of nuanced conversations in which instead of someone speaking for her, she spoke for herself, and through her doing that, I saw a wake up in this young man's eyes, like in the preparation for bringing them together, we had gotten to the point where I knew he wasn't going to do or say anything that was going to re-victimize her, um, but that wasn't going to be satisfactory or sufficient. She wanted to see him fully take responsibility and have a good understanding of what it is that he had done and why it was problematic uh, in order for her to feel that he both uh, could could say this was my shame, not yours, and that he could also um, understand she could feel that he was not going to do this again. Uh, so that will that wake up moment happened for him uh, when she was really breaking it down. So um, you know, I think uh, there there are countless stories that people could tell, and we are certainly not the only people facilitating these dialogues. Uh, direct dialogues, but um, I think from my side, um, what I can say is that they go really well when they are properly prepared, where there is a real understanding of what taking responsibility uh, is, and when uh, survivors really get to define, not just, uh, obviously, every all of this must, wasn't obvious, I needed to say it, is voluntary, right, that survivors want to, uh, we want to give survivors total autonomy uh, in choosing whether or not to participate, in choosing the degree to which they participate, um, in de developing the entire process in a way that is attendant to, to survivor needs. Um, that, that in and of itself is the beginning of the empowerment process. Uh, but in addition, right, um, having reasonable expectations of what it is that you're going to hear in these, in these uh, conferences or in this, in this process is really critical. So um, a little bit of background about what some of these stories look like. Uh, you know, in the past, there's been a lot of resistance and fear uh, to restorative justice uh, in the context of sexual harm and intimate partner violence. And I think that it's important for us to legitimize those fears. <laughs> um, it's really important for us to listen to the fears of advocates and survivors, and even those who've done harm, about how these processes could be manipulated, could be problematic. Um, and um, so 
you know, there are places in this country where there is legislation that says restorative justice can happen in these cases, but never for domestic violence, right? And we hear all the time, I'm, and I'm having somebody research this right now, um, whether or not there are OVW, OVC, uh, VAWA grants that say uh, you cannot use this for restorative justice. And well, I do think that there might be some places where it's been said that you can't use it for mediation. Um, and there is a, an important distinction to draw between restorative justice and mediation, which I will get to. Um, you know, there's, there, there has been this historical opposition, um, and I, I think it's important to name it. So what, I've sort of broken it down into these three big feminist fears, uh, which is what um, I would love to, to share with you about, which is the first one is just super, super important, right, that victims will lack safety and agency in restorative practices. So there's nothing um, uh, that a, a circle in and of itself provides that will necessarily undermine um, what we know about the power and control wheel and cycles of violence and, and other dynamics that occur in intimate partner violence and sexual harm. Um, so I think it's really I think that's important to say. Just because you go out and get a circle training doesn't mean that you can start doing um, restorative justice processes. Um, I think another, uh, with, with these more serious crimes, there's more that needs to be done, right? Uh, the next one is that restorative justice will return particularly intimate partner violence to the private sphere uh, after so much work has been done by so many advocates to have restorative justice, uh, to have uh, domestic violence, intimate partner violence, not be something that you know police officers t tell somebody to take a walk around the block and cool down about, right? Um, and that it never makes its way into court. And then third, that restorative justice undermines certain feminist um, theories on what are the causes of violence against women. And so that one's a, a little bit more complicated. Um, so uh, I think we need to start by saying that um, Restorative justice is really not mediation. And I think that when we're talking about survivor agency and safety, it is really, really important to remember that the questions are, who has been harmed and what do they need? And then that one, we might be holding safety planning right into that, what do, what do we need? And then whose obligation is it to meet those needs? This is not about right uh, two people who have two different stories to drive uh, some something to the center. I, I remember in law school uh, learning how to do um, settlement negotiations, and I heard a professor say, if, if everybody's not miserable with the outcome, every, you know, this was a failure. <laughs> Everybody has to give up a whole lot in order to properly and quickly drive a settlement negotiation. So we never want to have that kind of attitude after a sexual harm or, or domestic violence occurred, right? Um, and instead, we really need to think about restorative justice is an accountability process in which people who are ready to at least begin the process of taking responsibility for what they have done uh, are, are ready to come into dialogue with somebody uh, that they have harmed. Um, so uh, this is not about two stories driving to the middle, uh, but rather accountability about a thing that has occurred. Um, so um, another way in which we can really assure survivor agency and safety is to put victim-identified needs at the center of restorative processes. And this may be a shift for some of us who, particularly those of us who have done uh, shelter work, and we have sort of welcomed people who literally, um, you know, are covered in bruises and choking marks and things of that nature and who uh, feel very broken and, um, you know, to themselves and feel very incapable um, of making basic decisions sometimes at that point in their lives, right? Um, that, that I think we leave survivors stuck at that place and that we have to remember that people transform from places uh, where they were maybe uh, on the edge of, 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 of lethality um, towards a place where they really do know what they want and need. Um, I think we also really have to stop pathologizing uh, that people stay uh, in relationships, uh, not just because of fiscal reasons or other reasons, but we have to really understand that, that some people are going to choose to stay together uh, for reasons that may not 
make sense to us in our own personal relationships. But if we really want to help folks stay violence free, um, that we really do have to look at victim identified needs, even when they don't line up with ours. Um, and I think what's also really wonderful about survivor agency and safety in restorative processes is that, you know, a, a survivor and their own chosen supporters really are quote unquote enforcers. And I really put this in uh, quotation marks because um, survivors are, uh, you know, we, we, we're not enforcers in the sense that the families and communities set the um, set the, the culture and the, t and, the, and the terms for what it means to be in family and community. Um, and when we are uh, collectively doing that, something is, uh, there's some possibility there of uh, something that is collectively agreed to, uh, including those who've done harm. And so um, that, that feels like, again, uh, placing agency back in the hands of the person who's, who suffered harm. Um, it's important, too, to know that when we say community-based, that doesn't necessarily mean private. It could be if the circle is too small, right? But, uh, but it can actually be a way of getting things out in the open in ways that if the only option is to call the police, that things may actually be more likely to remain private. I often say I did not want my father incarcerated. I didn't want to trigger what what did I know then? You know, potential immigration consequences. I didn't know what my mother's immigration status was. Was it tied to my father's immigration status? I mean, the very things designed in theory to protect me were the reasons I remained silent, right? I didn't want to be taken away from my sister and put in some other home where people didn't practice our religion, right? And so my, the, the sexual harm I was suffering in my home uh, remained private. Um, because there wasn't a community-based way for me to uh, address the harms that were happening, for us to address the harms that were happening in our family. So um, it's important to remember that restorative justice doesn't work without community. Um, we use the sort of social work tool of con concentric spheres and helping people determine who's going to be in the circle with you or who's going to be in the conference with you. Uh, and so, you know, who are the people closest to you? And then we go through a process of, are those people people who um, are, are good for you? Are they people who want to see you move forward in a good way? Are they, do they collude with your abuser, right? Do they, um, or do they put you down? Um, and, and, and the same with the person who's done harm, right? Who's that who wants to see you succeed? Is that someone who, uh, always uh, takes your side even when you're wrong? Is it someone who has uh, a belief that it's okay to hit women, to hit people, right? And we really uh, work through like who are all the people in your life, in your closest circle, in your next furthest out circle, who are some other people that you may want to have in that circle to help you move forward in a good way? Um, so that is, that's the next, um, I think that's, uh, sort of the most important step, step is to have the right people in the circle. Uh, victim offender dialogue, DOD is victim offender dialogue. Uh, I don't believe that when it's like a one-on-one -on -one dialogue uh, that that is a sufficient model. Some victim offender dialogue models include additional people. I think with ongoing or recent harm, really a one-on-one -on -one conversation is, is not a way to produce a safety plan collectively uh, that, is, that is held by the family and community more broadly. So uh, to that end, I think that uh, VOD is, a, is a, a model that I really, I've learned so much from. Um, and it's something that's often done in prison, you know, 15, 20 years after harm has occurred. Uh, survivors get answers to questions that they could never have gotten if they didn't sit down with a person who harmed them. Um, and so I'm not trying to be disparaging in any way of that model. I just don't think it's the, it's the right model in terms of thinking about moving us um, out of the private sphere and to make sure that there are more eyes on the situation um, as we move forward. I also think we need to avoid third-party decider models. So uh, some people think of community courts as restorative. I, I personally don't. Um, I think anytime when there's sort of a third-party decider, reparative boards, things of that nature, um, that it really is both uh, in some ways disempowering the survivor to not be a key decision maker uh, in the consensus process. <laughs> and also, um, 
excuse me, sorry, one second. Um, also, um, we don't know that those people necessarily have the most nuanced understandings of intimate partner violence and sexual harm. Um, but, but more than anything, I don't like that it is sort of utterly unrelated people getting involved, in a sense, in uh, people's, um, people's lives uh, and aren't going to stay connected to people's lives. Um, but, and I think I already touched on this last bullet point, that in a sense, a community-based process is evinced by my own story and the stories of countless other survivors I know who do not contact the state or services um, for fear of immigration consequences, et cetera, um, that uh, increased uh, safety for survivors uh, is, is a possible potential outcome for, a, um, for those who are unwilling to uh, engage with state actors. So some of you may have seen an article a few years ago uh, in the New York Times, um, I think it was like in 2012, uh, called Can Forgiveness Play a Role in Criminal Justice? Uh, it was about a case that I worked on in uh, Tallahassee, Florida, uh, where a young man, uh, this young man, Connor McBride, uh, killed his uh, fiance, Anne Gromer. And um, we used a restorative justice uh, circle process inside Connor's jail as a way of helping determine the plea deal. Um, and I think that this is something that we might want to consider more for not just intimate partner violence, but in all homicide cases in which the family members are not interested, the surviving family members are invested in a trial not being the way that they want uh, the case to be resolved, right? Uh, as a former public defender who worked in offices in which um, we defended people who caused intimate partner violence and sexual harm, uh, the cross-examination process, or in homicide cases, the way in which we paint uh, the deceased person uh, is never good, um, and especially doesn't really attend to the needs of surviving family members. So uh, just a word about the word forgiveness here. While the Gromers, uh, who are the parents of Anne Gromer, who passed away, did go through their own personal process of forgiving Connor, um, that didn't mean that they didn't want him to serve time or that they weren't invested in his um, transforming himself into somebody who would never do this again. And they didn't believe that their personally letting go of anger was any sort of um, guarantee that Connor was going to be transformed, right? Connor's transformation process was an independent thing uh, to their personal feelings of forgiveness. And so I, I found the title of this article tricky because it conflates, in a way, restorative justice and forgiveness. The article sort of covers both things. And so I just want to name that restorative justice uh, doesn't require as a prerequisite for or uh, for participation in, nor uh, as, a, as a required outcome of uh, restorative justice or forgiveness is not required uh, of these, of, of, in any way of survivors before, during, or after. Uh, it may occur, um, but I, I, I tend to have a more um, complicated relationship to the notion of forgiveness. Uh, I think we should be um, careful about how we conflate these things uh, and, and, and to not conflate them, really. Uh, sometimes survivors just want safety or or in a burglary case, they just want their stuff back and they don't have to also forgive, right? Um, and the restorative justice process may be better at getting those other kinds of needs met. Um, but a little bit more about this case, I think it was sort of widely read and um, a lot of really important questions came up. Um, another, um, uh, this is a picture of both Connor's parents and, and Anne's parents and um, they really were invested in working together to figure out how it is that uh, the Gromer's needs could get met. Um, and some of the things that came out of the dialogue were uh, a desire that, that Connor ended up getting a sentence of 20 years, um, and uh, which is very low for Florida uh, for a homicide case. Um, but also with the understanding that Connor was going to be developing programs inside jail to help other men take responsibility for their domestic violence. Uh, that Connor was going to be um, uh, working on his own public speaking so that when he's released from prison someday uh, or even was willing to go to high schools in shackles with the grown heirs to talk about taking their daughter's life. Um, 
and uh, what would it look like to uh, build plea, you know, plea agreements that meet the direct needs of, of survivors uh, in cases like this? Um, again, you know, people call this a domestic violence case that I worked on. I disagree. Uh, Anne is gone. Uh, her life was taken, and so this wasn't about a dialogue between Connor and Anne. Uh, this is the aftermath of, of a homicide that uh, involved domestic violence. Um, but I do think that there's uh, lessons to be learned here about sort of Connor's transformation and, and what his commitment, his continued commitment is to taking the harms that he's done uh, and transforming into something that can be of benefit to other men who do this harm and to the people uh, that they would, they would harm. Um, and one of the sad things that came out of the article really was a lot of, not a lot, but some level of backlash against particularly Andy and, and, uh, and Kate, his wife, around, you know, if you really loved your daughter, you wouldn't do this. And this is a picture of Andy at, his, at her memorial service. And I just feel like it's always important to show this. Uh, it shows the, the depth of love he has for, for Anne. Um, and uh, to know that really a part of his decision making was to in no way have her reputation sullied. Uh, through the trial process um, and the things that a defense attorney uh, would do um, and uh, in the process of, you know, trying to minimize the amount of time Connor spent in prison. And, and instead, what we got in that restorative justice process was a full accounting of the harms that were done. The first several hours of this five-hour circle involved the Gromers telling the story of Anne to Connor and his parents and uh, a victim advocate and the priest from their church and the defense attorney and the district attorney, really who was their daughter and what was lost um, by this act and what Connor taking their daughter's life did to them. That is, that is, how, that is what a huge part of the process was. Um, and I think that it was really what it, what it should be, really. Um, the amount of time spent on Connor uh, was minimal comparatively, but one of the most powerful things that came from that circle was an admission on the part of Connor's father that um, he, he said, you know, I taught Connor how to be this angry. I taught Connor, you know, these behaviors. And, um, and it was really important, I think, to understand this within the family context and to see um, where all the linkages were along the way uh, that led to this horrific situation. So, um, a little bit about sexual violence. Um, uh, so this comes from uh, Tabashnik and Klein's uh, reasoned approach, reshaping, reshaping sex offender policy to prevent child sexual abuse is modified a bit. We looked at 100 cases of child sexual abuse in this country. You know, one in four girls and one in six boys, uh, this is what we have reported. I personally think it's much higher than this, uh, are sexually abused as children. Um, of those cases, less than 3% are convicted. And when we think about conviction, we know, you know, I always think about Amita Swabin, um, you know, a, 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 she and I are in a, a fellowship with the Just Beginnings Collaborative uh, Fellowship together. And, um, you know, they always talk about the fact that they went through a trial, you know, it's a rare situation where, you know, a case actually goes all the way to trial. And uh, their testimony against their father as a child was, really um, limited in, in relationship to what all actually happened to them. Um, Amita started being raped by her father when she was four years old. And, you know, her father got away with, you know, basically probation. And we know uh, that he went on to do future sexual harm, right? So the system really isn't working. I'm not sure if I already said this, but I had heard uh, in a gathering that we'd had on restorative justice and domestic violence, uh, in New Mexico, um, what B. Hansen had spoken about uh, a study that showed that 50% of survivors of intimate partner violence do not contact the system. And uh, of the 50% who do, uh, only 20% say it made them safer. 20% uh, say it made them less safe. So uh, when we look at how the current criminalization approach is working to end intimate partner violence, sexual harm, I think we really need to uh, imagine that there might be other ways of doing things that could be better suited to actually ending uh, child sexual abuse. So um, oh, before I get to that, uh, next slide. So a lot of my inspiration comes from a community uh, in uh, an Ojibwa community in Manitoba, Canada. Uh, and uh, it's called Hollow Water. I would strongly advise watching this movie. You can get it for free 
uh, from the Canadian Film Review Board online. And it is about a community um, in which uh, in the hollow water, basically an entire generation, was forcibly taken away during the boarding school crisis in Canada and placed in boarding schools where the children there were uniformly sexually abused, uh, physically abused, some were murdered, uh, for those that were returned to their community, right, within the next uh, several years, uh, alcoholism pandemic arose, um, as did other pandemics around intimate partner violence and sexual harm, um, in a circle, in a discussion that was happening amongst a group of women who wanted to understand what is this rate of alcoholism about uh, in our communities. Um, they, um, they started to also name that they had all been sexually abused. Um, and then what continued to happen through those conversations is that people, adults, started admitting that they were continuing to pass on this transgenerational trauma, that they were sexually abusing uh, children in their own communities um, and in their own families. And so uh, it was reported that over 80% of the kids in this community were sexually abused. Over 40% were self-reporting sexually abusing kids in the community. Um, and so the uh, the Crown, the government got involved saying, you know, we're going to, you know, remove these children from their homes again. And, and so the community said, hold up, the last time you removed us <laughs> um, created this hot mess that we are in now. So how about uh, we, uh, we relearn our medicine? And so some folks from the Cree Nation came in and uh, taught folks about circle. And, and um, so from, um, uh, so uh, the Cree taught the Ojibwa how to, uh, to address child sexual abuse through a uh, circle, through a, a, a healing circle process. Um, and during the period of time in which this pro project went on, there were only two reported cases uh, of sexual harm. And so uh, it's a very powerful film. I would strongly advise watching it. Please know that you are going to be watching people sitting in a circle with their own children that they sexually abuse, admitting that they sexually abuse these kids. The kids are talking about, you know, we really couldn't trust mom and dad before, but now we can. Um, I really appreciate the film, too, because it, it, it unearths the reality that it is not just men who cause sexual harm or intimate partner violence, right? And that uh, there are mothers and women uh, admitting to sexual harm that they cause. Uh, it's really a very powerful uh, film. So, um, so standards, what should they be? Um, you know, I think it's really important that Restorative justice should always, always, always be voluntary uh, for survivors, uh, in theory for everyone. But the truth is, is that, you know, Howard often says to me, restorative justice, Howard there says, restorative justice isn't, I don't know where this word voluntary came from. He said, for folks who've done harm, uh, community norms are not voluntary. It is not voluntary to not beat your wife or your kids, or uh, these are not things that are voluntary, right? These are our community norms. The question is, what do you need in order to not do this? Uh, because you need to not do this. <laughs> and we are here to help you not do this. Um, but, but it, you know, at least voluntary for survivors is I think it's important to, to name it that way. Um, we have to start with asking survivors and folks who've been harmed what the program should look like. You know, you can use circle as focus groups in your community to have survivors uh, do tell us what is good about this. We also want to do circles with people who've done harm, right? Uh, with folks maybe enrolled in those intervention programs who are making steps towards changing their behaviors. Uh, even in prisons where people are serving time for killing uh, their, their loved ones, their family members, um, what does it look like to um, ask them, uh, wh what would you have done with a restorative justice process? Would you have manipulated it? How would you have manipulated it? Um, what um, what, you know, what do we need to know from you, from the mindset you had then and the mindset you have now, uh, to make this as safe as possible for people participating in it? Uh, what would you have needed to participate in a good way in this? Um, I think it's a really important to understand that it's more than just 40 hours of training in RJ and, and, and in DV. Uh, again, peacemakers are not neutral. We have to come with a true understanding of what it is that these harms are and, um, and that we're not um, uh, that we're not about you know uh, covering things up or making things nice. Uh, that we really are about accountability and safety 
uh, in, in restorative justice processes around uh, intimate partner violence and sexual harm. Um, and that things like safety planning can be folded into a restorative justice process, lethality assessments, all of these things. It's not like we want to throw out the baby with the bathwater, right? Like there's there are many, many beautiful things we've learned from the years in which uh, we've been working to end uh, domestic violence and sexual harm. What are those parts and tools that can be folded into restorative justice processes? I do think at the same time we want to avoid professionalization, uh, certification type things that limit community capacity to intervene, right? Not just because I often say, <laughs> you know, uh, people say, you know, what, is this a job for therapists, is this a job for lawyers, and I often say, you know, can you take off your hat and actually just be a circle keeper? Um, can, you know, can you be uh, leading with the wisdom of the people in the space instead of with your theoretical model or your therapeutic approach or your concern about who's giving up what rights? You know, that's not what restorative justice is about. Um, uh, and I think that the more we professionalize and certify things, the less we, uh, th those things often play out in biased ways, right? So uh, we want to make sure that it's not, um, we had had a problem in, in almost all of our movements uh, to make the world a better place where um, there are hierarchies um, and there is, um, there's discrimination. And uh, we want to make sure that we're not replicating that in the way in which we're taking what is ultimately a community-based approach um, and making it more available, uh, more widespread. Um, I think it's important for the nonprofits that choose to do this work, or even the district attorneys may ultimately want to send cases to restorative justice, uh, that when we have this discretion, um, we have discrimination, right? So it's too easy. Like in our youth diversion work, we are very clear that there should be a set of criteria. And when we choose this set of criteria, it's a certain type of case, it's a certain type of um, it's a certain severity of case, that all cases in which survivors want this case to go to restorative justice, that we allow that to happen, right? That we don't have some sort of personal override that prevents people from being able to do it. Because when we do have that override, we tend to uh, cut, uh, uh, cut out uh, cases of folks of color, right? Uh, we, that, that is the way that uh, discretion always equals discrimination. Uh, we know that from our federal sentencing data. We know that from a lot of different um, places. So, um, so there's a question about other things that we might want to consider adding, like matters intervention programs uh, before uh, restorative justice dialogues. Uh, should somebody go through a BIP? If so, what kind of BIP should they do um, before uh, going through the process? I think that there are some types of programs that can be really beneficial for priming someone for a direct dialogue, for really helping them. I think about things like um, uh, the, the work done in a victim offender education group um, in San Quentin Penitentiary where I've seen real deep work happening about excavating uh, the root causes of offending. Um, the Resolve to Stop the Violence program in the San Francisco Sheriff's uh, Jail uh, runs uh, where I personally go in as a survivor to these programs and talk about my own journey. There are other types of programs that might be beneficial in better intervention programs. Um, domestic violence safe dialogue. Uh, is another one um, where you know people are really learning how to to unearth and and dialogue even not with your direct victim but with other victims. Um, maybe that's a step that people would want to take before coming into uh, a restorative justice dialogue. Um, and there are going to be those circumstances where you don't need those things, where you have and I have worked with people who are ready to take responsibility and change their lives and not revictimize their victims and want help in moving in that direction. Um, and I leave this what else because I really think that the wisdom is with all of you, uh, what you know about the communities and cultures and uh, peoples that you are working with, with the survivors you're working with, with the folks who've done harm that you're working with, um, that really do have uh, the wisdom about what it is uh, that needs to happen moving forward. Um, and so finally, I think that there is a, a larger restorative justice uh, question that we need to ask. Uh, which is, um, I mean, a, a, a restorative justice and a domestic violence. Um, so, you know, I've talked a little bit about having been um, occasionally un, um, unceremoniously uh, exited from meetings and conferences and things of that nature. And I, I know other people have had uh, this experience as well, um, where we have questioned uh, criminalization as the primary approach or even uh, as a as a as a useful approach uh, to ending domestic violence. And 
Um, in the 1980s and the uh, you know early 90s, um, there were sort of party lines about what we were and were not allowed to talk about, and a lot of voices that wanted to ask different questions, and particularly voices of women of color, uh, were exited from the movement. <laughs> and so um, I found my home in the criminal defense uh, community in some ways, but uh, there I wasn't really feeling like my heart's work, which is around ending interfamilial and sexual violence, ending interpersonal uh, violence, um, really was fully embraced inside the defense community as well. Um, and I would really love to see a, a, a really deep dialogue happen uh, within uh, the domestic violence movement um, and within movements to end sexual harm where those voices that were, were sort of pushed out but are now being invited back into spaces, um, really th that we start there with compassion and accountability and truth and reconciliation uh, about the very different views that we may have. Uh, and um, I just love this quote from uh, Nelson Mandela, which I think speaks uh, to so many parts of the work that we're doing, which is reconciliation does not mean forgetting or trying to bury the pain of conflict, but that reconciliation means working together to correct the legacy of past injustice. Uh, and that is, um, and sometimes present injustice, right? And so that is uh, something that I'm personally very committed to, both in the movement work and uh, in the work uh, with the with the growing uh, the growing the work of uh, working in with cases um, in which you know we're actually addressing ongoing harm or recent harm. Um, so that's that's it for me. Um, I want to say thank you and really onward with love and solidarity for all the amazing work folks have done and uh, very open to questions. I know that Suo has probably been doing it quite a job of, I see a lot of movement. I've been trying to not look at the chat box because it's distracting. It's, it's very but. impressive that you <laughs> managed to do that because there was a lot of movement. So we have a lot of questions, but we have a chunk of time here. Um, you know, I just want to make sure that we circle back to talking about voluntariness mm -hmm. and to underscore that, again, just to start before we get, dive into the questions, if you don't mind. Sure. So honestly, you know, when we work on cases sort of quote unquote off the grid uh, is what we call it. I get calls from survivors uh, who say that they want to do this. And those are the cases that I've been most interested in doing. I don't actually do too much direct facilitation right now because um, my amazing team is uh, working in 10 jurisdictions across the nation to roll out youth diversion programs. Uh, that's not domestic violence specific. We usually start with burglaries there. And then also working with um, um, the Family Justice uh, Center at, um, in Contra Costa County around training folks uh, to do domestic violence work there and then trying to come up with our own writing and thinking about uh, safety standards, best practices, uh, based on the wisdom of survivors and folks who've done harm and really building things out from that side. Um, but when I do facilitate cases, it's my number one focus is to be sure that this is being done voluntarily, right? Is somebody pushing you into this? Is this something that you're being strong-armed into by anyone? Um, something that you have, is this a story that you've bought that you need to get along and make nice? And, you know, why is it that you want to do this? Um, I think that this is a really critical, critical piece of the work um, is, whether or not this should be happening at all. Um, and to really trust our instincts without um, making too many decisions for other people, especially when survivors are telling you that they're going to stay together with someone or that they're going to stay in community with someone, right? This person, uh, you know, I'm a part of this community, this activist community, this person raped me, I'm still at meetings with them. Um, that That is someone who we want to help have a dialogue, right? Um, and so uh, if that is what they want to do. So 100% voluntary at all times, um, definitely uh, from the perspective of, especially if the state's going to be involved in diverting cases to restorative justice, uh, that you know victims just have to have an absolute override about um, their participation in with these particular crimes. Like that's just the, that's like a bedrock. I don't know if that's sufficient answer for your question, Suo. No, that's that's great. So I'm sorry, I'm printing out. Mm -hmm. A couple more questions here. Um, not surprisingly, a uh, number of the questions really came up about manipulative mm -hmm. people who do harm. 
And I, as you know better than most, I mean, part of the criticism is that this process can be so very useful for people who really don't understand the impact of their actions. But mm -hmm. I think the questions really are, like, how does it work when people, like, are very in intent on under, you know, like creating that harm and do really mm -hmm. understand the impact of the action. So let me just get the, these questions out together and then um, if mm -hmm. you could answer them. Uh, one was about, you know, dealing with charismatic and manipulative abusers. How does this process handle those dynamics? How would it look for a perpetrator that primarily uses gaslighting and or has narcissistic behaviors? Um, I have concerns and reservations around IPV abusers who know what they are doing and they know it's wrong and harmful, but who continue to use coercive control to abuse their partners. These abusers yeah. are often manipulative and charismatic, and I must admit I'm skeptical about RJ with these cases. Sure. So am I. <laughs> so let me be clear uh, that RJ isn't right now for everything, right? And I'm, I want to say, I want to... So I don't know how many folks on the line work with folks who have done harm. Everyone who has abused people that are beloved to them, right, and everyone who has sexually assaulted someone has carried some uh, story that needs to be unlearned, right, that has acted out of something that needs to be unlearned. Um, and so there's room for transformation uh, for every single person who's done this harm. Right, um, and then there's a handful of folks, and, and to be frank, I've talked with lots of folks who've done harm, sexual harm, uh, domestic violence, intimate partner violence, who don't fit the category of people that you are talking about, right? And so a lot of this is about a really skilled facilitator being able to hold the line when people are exhibiting those kinds of super tricky behaviors, uh, whether they can see it themselves, they can't see it themselves. But every single person who has done sexual intimate partner violence does not have those characteristics. That is not, like, that is a story that I think we need to, to stop telling inside the domestic violence community, uh, that all abusers are X. I have met many people who have caused harm, and there are many different types of people. Uh, all of them have something they need to shift in their thinking and their behavior. Um, not all of them are narcissistic, manipulative. Um, that's, that's, there are some who, sh who have those characteristics. My fundamental personal belief is even those folks can change. Um, the question is, does this family, this community, this, uh, this circle have what it takes to hold that person responsible for those kinds of behaviors? I, and, and if the answer is no, then this is not the right circle. This is not the right, you know, and you may need to be having a survivor circle just for the survivor to figure out how to get out of that relationship, right? Um, hopefully that's something that the survivor is coming to. Um, but it's also okay to say, especially, so I am all about those of us with lived experience being deeply involved in this work, right? I have lived through the things that I am talking about. And I know what my capacity is to hold these spaces. And so I'm allowed to say, this is not a circle that I think we should be keeping, or this is not a circle that I have the capacity to keep, right? Or that we haven't figured out the skills on this yet. Um, there may also be times when you partner with um, folks who do really good batters intervention on this, and that they are your uh, really important point I didn't bring up um, for domestic violence and um, sexual harm, there always needs to be a co-facilitator. No one should be facilitating these cases alone, in part because, especially for those of us with lived experience, no, I take that back, for those of us with lived experience and for those of us without lived experience with these issues, we have blind spots. And so we need two people holding down these spaces together to see what we might be missing. And one of those people has to be somebody who is really good at seeing and naming and, um, uh, and holding folks accountable for uh, manipulative behavior. And that doesn't mean that the facilitator is responsible for uh, doing that kind of work. This is not a facilitator-heavy role. Rather, in the preparation 
for the direct dialogue, which may take weeks and months uh, to, to get ready to be in, in a direct dialogue. Um, many, many weeks and months and months sometimes to get people in the room together uh, to have these conversations. Um, that, that accountability, the capacity, if you are a colluder, you know you are, right? I have a friend who works in the field who, who says, I, I would collude. <laughs> That's so good to know that about yourself, right? So who's going who's gonna to hold the space with you, right? Um, who's going to hold that space with you? Because uh, you need to know those kinds of things about yourself. Uh, so the two co-facilitators can, can sort of cover those bases. So that's, that's a little bit about it. And again, um, we don't have to start with those cases. Um, the cases that I facilitated, um, one guy had a little bit of manipulative stuff, right? But mostly they were cases of the person who did the harm had a genuine desire to change this behavior. And um, those folks have stayed violence-free since then. Um, and, and I think that that's really important to, uh, it doesn't mean that their relationships are perfect. They are, they're not the relationship I personally would want, um, but, but they are, you know, situations in which I thought that there could be potential lethality down the road have, have uh, communication and dialogue and understanding uh, instead right now. Um, again, not the marriage I would want. That is not the standard uh, that I hold uh, these cases to. So staying on the uh, facilitator question, there were a number of questions about that or facilitator mm -hmm. issues. And one was uh, somebody just suggested uh, also having a monitor. Is that something, something you use or are familiar mm -hmm. with? Monitor. So um, in the youth diversion work that we do, we have like a sort of an ongoing, so there's a plan to repair the harm. Let's say a kid burglarizes a home, right? And they're going to make it right by their victim. They worked with their victim, families, communities came together, came up with a four-part plan to repair the harm. Doing right by your victim, your parents, your community, and yourself. And that plan is it's a smart plan, so it's specific, measurable, attainable, related to the harm, and timely. And so, um, you know, I, I, I don't think that that's necessarily the way that um, it would always work in a, in a DV case. But um, what we, um, what, you know, what we do often have is like an agreements manager where that plan is either monitored by one of the facilitators or by an agreements manager. Um, yeah, but monitoring generally, I'm not sure if I'm fully understanding the question, but monitoring really is through family and community. In my dream world, this circle that sorts this out on a one-time basis continues on with or without the facilitator that people continue to be in dialogue. So there is uh, one couple whose lives I've been involved in for decades um, where the question of the violence that occurred a long time ago continues to be raised uh, in a loving and open and shameless way. And, uh, how, you know, there's sort of like a temperature check that continues to be taken on um, sort of the triggers for the violence in the past and the uh, dynamics that gave rise to it. And none of this involves victim blaming, right? This is we're very, very clear, right? And that is a, so there's that monitoring in a sense that the family and the community become continued monitors at the barbecue and when people have been drinking and <laughs> when somebody stayed out too late at night, like what? Who are, who are the people in the family and community that become the monitors? That's really what a community-based process is about, not um, having some sort of external person um, available at all times, right? That's, that's, the, that's the end goal, um, is that, there, that we create new family systems and processes that keep an eye on things um, moving forward. So you said that uh, to be a facilitator, it's more than 40 hours of RJ and or DV training. Um, and some of the questions that have come up is, is there a specific format or framework? Is there a facilitator's guide? There's another question about, mm -hmm. I've heard there can be two facilitators, one that works pre-conference with the perpetrator and one that works with the victim survivor. Thoughts about that? Yeah, that's the way they do it in New Zealand around sexual harm. I personally would like for us to not have, like, teams. <laughs> I like for each facilitator to be deeply involved with both the person who's been, the primary person who's been harmed and the primary person who's done harm. Um, I think that it, it can reduce the potential for splitting in the team. Um, but uh, generally speaking, um, you know, 
the two facilitators, and then whatever other services are needed. You know, maybe it's a batter's intervention program up front. Maybe it's uh, continued school survivor circles for the survivors who are all in this with, you know, there's so many different ways in which we could imagine this. We are really at the beginning. Is there a facilitator guide that's DV specific? No, uh, not yet, but to my knowledge. Um, Moody and I are working on it. Um, and, um, you know, we really have this blessing of working in Contra Costa County with this group of advocates who are just giving this a try for the first time. Um, and these are folks who've been working in DV for a very long time, right? So that's what I mean by not just the 40 hours. Like, I don't want people to run out and get a circle training and a 40-hour training uh, in DV and then think that, or, or sexual violence, right, a rape crisis training, and then think that you can go do this. Um, the muscle for being able to sit with conflict and harm and for um, making sure that folks get held accountable is something that is better to build in other crimes. So I did burglaries and robberies uh, for a long time, right? I, I, was a, I was a victim advocate, and I worked in shelters, and I did rape crisis. I did all of that for years. And then I was um, a... Uh, and then I was a restored justice facilitator for like burglaries and car theft. And then I started moving into teen dating violence and sexual harm. Um, but it was through the process of learning how to hold people accountable for a burglary that I built the muscle. Um, I think it's harder with DV and with sexual violence. Um, we, have, we are so, like, we're, you know, it's like we often use these examples of you would have never told somebody that they, their wallet was looking too big right, when they got pickpocketed, right? <laughs> and we use those examples. So it's very easy to see accountability in burglaries and robberies. And um, we have all been swimming in the sea of patriarchy and all these other things um, when, we, um, when we are dealing with intimate partner violence and sexual harm. And so uh, we have to be really solid uh, in our understandings of those dynamics uh, in order to uh, facilitate a restorative justice case. And at the same time, um, it's really important for us, I think, on the on the advocate side to unlearn some of our more rigid notions of it. I, I get back to that bullet point that I sort of skimmed over, which is um, what are the what are the beliefs in why abuse occurs? And there are a lot of folks who hold to this notion that um, people abuse because they can. And any time that there is a power differential that all those on the top of the power differential will maximize it um, and manipulate it to their benefit. And I don't think that that's true. Um, I, I think that we have to uh, drop those very, um, those sort of oversimplified notions of people who have power in the patriarchy, uh, masculine and center folks, uh, men, um, and, and likewise, like all um, people of any category that have power over, right? Um, that there are lots of people who have power over who don't want to and don't want to fall prey to abusing it. And, um, and restorative justice, I think we need to come to this work from a place of believing in the capacity of these folks to change. Um, because if we don't, then we're doomed. <laughs> so I don't want us to be doomed. I want us to figure out how to cohabitate and to love and to share and to have happy, healthy sexual relationships, um, even under the current state of power differential, which necessarily occurs you know, uh, the patriarchy is over and racism is over and transphobia and homophobia and all, all of it, uh, ableism, until all of it ends, uh, we have power. And so we have to learn how to, uh, to engage with each other um, across that. Okay, so there are a gazillion questions here and more coming in. So all I can say to okay. people is right. we're doing I'll our be best sure to get to as many as we can. <laughs> so it's a little tricky. I'll but. get off my soapbox too. And no, I'll no, no, it's so <laughs> helpful. It's so, it's just, you know, I mean, maybe we're going to need to do a part two. So I'm just, just saying. Um, so one of the questions was uh, about people who are involved, who are not involved in the criminal legal system, and how, like you, you gave some examples about how kids who are are involved in the criminal legal system or others are getting 
involved with restorative justice processes, and the question was, what if they're not, and how might they get involved? Um, and then another set of questions, actually, is for cases that are going through the legal system. Um, and at what point in these cases do you usually get involved with, like, if you're going to do a circle? Is it pre-trial, mm -hmm. post-conviction? Um, and it sounds like you've yeah. done them at different points. Yeah, the only time that I do things sort of pre-trial is in homicide cases. I, I, you know, I haven't done a lot of that kind of thing. Um, I've advised other folks on it. I really think that if it's not pre-trial, that it needs to be pre-charge. And let me explain why. Um, I, I believe that there are many circumstances. When I think about those 20% of survivors of the 50 who contacted the system, who said that they were made less safe, less safe um, by, the, um, by contacting the system, I think that there are ways in which, until we have done the very hard and important work of getting those who have done harm to not feel like the victims of the people they've harmed, right? That uh, somehow you are the victim of her telling them, whoever they are, right, that you've harmed. Uh, you are the victim of that person contacting the system, right? And um, the further we move into uh, criminalization, the more people double down on that thinking. Um, you meet a rare person who is like, I'm so grateful that my partner called the police on me and I'm turning my life around because of, uh, you know, having been locked up and this and that and the other. Mostly it causes people to double, double down on, on their victimization. Uh, especially after you're charged and you have a defense attorney. And as a former defense attorney, <laughs> I know that we are not the best at getting people to take responsibility for the harms that they caused, right? That's not my job as a defense attorney. Sometimes it is, but it's my job for a parole hearing, right? After you've served all your time, and now now we're like, oh yeah, uh, you did that, and um, and you, you fully understood it, and you'll never do it again. That's when we start talking about that. After the whole thing is over, and you're trying to get back into society, uh, there's nothing um, there's nothing beneficial for survivors about that. So, um, so to my mind, catching folks at a moment in which, if they are still genuinely invested in uh, being in positive relationship with the person that they sexually harmed, or maintaining a relationship with their children, or um, having their children not be afraid of them, uh, or, or be afraid of what they're going uh, to do to their other parent anymore, right? Uh, these are the moments uh, where pre-charge um, that there can be some intervention. I also think that it's really good um, potential for where survivors are dropping cases. I get calls from DAs across the country being like, why is it a problem to charge survivors for refusing to testify against their abusers? I'm like, what have we come from? Or can we, you know, we, can, we, can we try something else? Um, so if a survivor decides to drop the case, do we want to make restorative justice available then? Uh, because we know that the abuse occurred, right? So that's another, that's the only other post-charge setting in which I would like for us to, to do this. But otherwise, uh, when people are coming in to, say, a family justice center, uh, in for, for, and they're saying, I don't want to contact the system, um, my goodness, especially for folks who have immigration consequences, et cetera, um, that these are the kinds of people that I think we want to make an alternative available. I don't know if I exactly answered the question, but that's the procedural posture. Um, that I think those are the procedural postures I feel are the best. Also, earlier is better. And once we're setting court dates and this and that and the other, uh, too much time has passed. You know, we want to really start to prep people for a safety and accountability type restorative justice dialogue um, quickly, uh, quickly before we go through more and more rounds of, of abusive um, dynamics. Um, we want to we want to get things. Uh, into dialogue out of the darkness and into family and community dialogue um, faster than uh, court systems operate. And you've said this, but the question came up a couple times. Are, are there crimes and people for whom this won't work? How does a young sure. child state their needs? Will the restorative justice process work for individuals with mental um, illness? I mean, those who have done harm, who mm -hmm. have mental illness. So, that was a lot of things. Let me see if I can scroll back through the text here. Um, uh, uh, let me see. The so first one was, does it work for everybody? No. <laughs> does it work for everybody now? Definitely not, right? This requires 
an acceptance of some level of responsibility. We don't, I don't know if I spelled this out enough, enough, right? This is an accountability model. So if you said you didn't do it or, you know, it was self-defense because she was hitting me, they were hitting me first, whatever, right? Um, you know, this is, this is really, uh, this is, those, those aren't necessarily, the, those, uh, let me be clear, those are not the right cases for restorative justice, right? Um, and um, so what I want is a world in which it is safe for everyone to admit what they did. All of us, all of us, including me, I'm not a perfect survivor. I have done things wrong. Al almost all of us have. Uh, and I want a space in which unconditional love means that we can actually, I want those who are close to me and my family and my community to love me knowing my weak parts and my, and my parts where I have a potential to do harm. Um, and my and and my gifts and my strengths and uh, the parts of me that have been harmed, uh, all of it, right? And so, um, until we have that world, well, there are consequences that uh, people may choose to not undergo by doubling down on their denial. Uh, those folks aren't ripe for a restorative justice process. Uh, so, um, one of the things that we try to work with is like district attorneys to have a confidentiality agreement, for example where nothing that's said in restorative processes can be used in a court of law. That doesn't prevent somebody from having the person that harmed them prosecuted based on other things, police reports, other stuff, but really to create safe spaces in which people can have these dialogues um, brings more information out. That has been my experience. Um, more information means more safety. Uh, that's, that's one of the things that, that we're going for. I don't remember. Mental illness was one of the other ones. So it depends, right? There's all kinds of different gradations of all of these things. Um, I have a dear friend who's a psychiatrist who feels it is absolutely imperative that most of her clients, um, almost all of her clients, uh, have the capacity to understand right from wrong and need to be properly supported with potentially a psychiatrist in the circle. Uh, to be uh, taking responsibility for the things that they've done wrong. I worry about ruling out mental health, uh, folks who uh, have been diagnosed with mental health issues, um, because particularly in today's day and age, ev ev almost everybody has a diagnosis. <laughs> so sort of like, what, um, what, if that's the bar, then, then it's too, um, it's too high, uh, to, yeah. So uh, that's another one. I don't remember what some of the other questions were. Oh, kids. So again, uh, what is who should be in the room? Sometimes you know there are many different ways in which we can do this, right? There's a beautiful story about um, it's the first story in a book called The Little Book of Family Group Conferences, New Zealand style, and it is about a young teenager who was raped by another teenager in her group home in New Zealand, and she chose to be outside the room uh, through two-way glass during the circle passing in, having her questions be asked by somebody else in the room. Um, you know, we really just have to attend to the needs of survivors based on the age appropriate. Do they want to even be there? Is somebody else going to be there for them? Do they have a surrogate? Um, understanding the impact of their behavior, right? Uh, really, it's just got to be all about what is good for the survivor. Um, so uh, the young people in that film with the Ojibwe folks, I think the youngest one was like eight. Uh, or nine, it appeared from the, from the film. And, and it seems to be incredibly beneficial for all of them uh, to be in that conversation with their family together. Um, so, uh, you know, I really think that all of these things, with all things restorative justice, it is case by case. There are no, and this is why standards and manuals are a little tricky, uh, because um, Lorraine uh, Stutzman Amstutz is one of my favorite trainers in restorative justice. Lorraine talks a lot about, she, every time you ask her a question, she says, it depends. <laughs> and then she gives six different ways in which this could play itself out. And I think she's spot on. You know, it really depends. Uh, every every uh, family system has a set of dynamics, and uh, they all need to be attended to. Every group of friends, every movement space, uh, every, you know, every organization has a set of dynamics. and. Uh, you have to be really attendant to all of them. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which is part of the reason this is so complicated and difficult. So. Yeah. So we are drawing to the end of the time that we have Ooh. together today. Uh, I think we should really seriously think about a part two. Uh, and we sure. can maybe do it in a question answer format. Um, but. Is there anything you would like to leave us with before we end for today? 
Hmm. A couple really brief things. One is that we are really, really at the beginning. Every single person mm -hmm. listening in and who will listen in in the future has so much wisdom to offer this, right? What we know is that our current systems are not working to meet the needs of the majority of survivors of sexual and intimate partner violence. And I really come to this work with a hope that we will do something that will work better, right? And that it is another thing that we can offer. Um, it is not a panacea. It is not the only way. Uh, it's the way I personally want to live and work. Um, and uh, there are many of us who do, and it's not holier than thou. It's none of that. <laughs> it is, it's a dialogue, <laughs> just like the thing itself. This is a dialogue, and I just really want to welcome people into the dialogue, particularly those of us with lived experience. I think that if we are going to move on to the next phase of our movement building, that we need to center the wisdom of survivors and of those who've done harm who want to see these harms end as well, right? And that we really want to be in deep dialogue with us at the center of coming up with solutions uh, to these harms. Um, that is really what my, my heart is uh, in this and really just excited to, to, to help keep moving this work uh, carefully, cautiously forward uh, with the wisdom of everybody uh, impacted by this. So I just want you to know I'm sitting in your old offices here in Philadelphia, <laughs> smiling from ear to ear. So that, thank you. It's just wonderful. And there's lots thank of excellent all. feedback. And folks, you'll be getting a little evaluation. And if you could take a, you know, a minute or two to fill it out, it's really very helpful. And that really is a big call for part two. So I really want to talk to you about that. Right on. Thank you Absolutely. so much. Okay. Take care. Thank folks. you, everybody. Uh, Suj Sujata, I'm going to give you a call, okay? Okay, sounds great. Thanks, folks. Bye. Conference will automatically end in 60 seconds.